Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast, where it is literally not about money. But lately, I'm focusing in on money because you guys have been saying, what about the money? The money is important, but it's not the end all be all. It is a vehicle for you to experience your life. Today, my guest is Jack Gibson. Say hi, Jack. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Emmett, thanks for having me, man. You know what? You look like a movie star, dude. No, oh, gosh. <laughs> you get that all the time? <laughs> no, never. So. <laughs> I can see you totally as an action star. Wow. Oh, that'd be cool. I love action movies. Right. I can see you as that guy that... Well, you're not a movie star. Not at all. You're a real estate guy and yes. an entrepreneur. Let's get to your backstory because I've tried my hand in real estate, failed miserably, and I probably needed a mentor like you. So what's your backstory? What got you into to where you are today? I mean, real estate's a tough business. So I mean, wow. <laughs> I can see why, you know, there's, it's tough. I mean, we're having, we're having our challenges too. But so, yeah, actually, uh, I got started in business when I was 19. I was a full-time college student. You know, my mom and dad were amazing parents. But their plan for me was always, hey, go to school get good grades, study hard, get a job, work your way up the corporate ladder, right? Yeah. And that was the plan that they took and it worked for them. I mean, my mom was a very successful teacher. My dad was um, investigated arson, you know, fires where people deliberately set and uh, had to figure out if they did it or not. <laughs> you guys lived in the Midwest too, right? Yeah. We grew up near Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. So people like to set fires for some odd reason in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> He had plenty of work. Yeah. Tell you that. So, you know, that that was the plan that they set for me. And although I had a different plan for myself, because I had always had in, you know, like in my depths of my soul, a, a desire to be my own business owner, be a boss, be an entrepreneur. So I didn't realize it was going to start so young. I was 19. I was sitting in my college dorm. I was a little disgruntled with the whole system and where I was heading in the kind of like the, the, like, what is this all I'm here to do is just study hard and get good grades. I want to build something right now. <laughs> so another college kid came through the dorms, was handing out flyers about nutrition products. So at first I kind of just didn't pay much attention to it, but then we saw each other a couple of times on campus and struck up a conversation. And that led me to, you know, becoming a distributor for the company, which is a multi-level marketing company. And, um, I, so I started that and it took me, I didn't have a great start, Emmett. I mean, it took me, <laughs> it took me, um, most people always talk about how, oh yeah, it just blew up right out of the gate, right? It, you <laughs> well, know, for, yep. for me, it was uh, eight months till I got my first commission check for $14. <laughs> and you probably ecstatic and, when you saw oh, that. Yeah, once I got that, man, I was like, wow, the floodgates are opened up. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but I, Luckily, I was in it for the long haul, right? Like I wasn't in it to make a quick buck and started to create some momentum and success after that first check. I don't know. Just like, like I just opened up my belief. It clicked. It clicked. Right. And so by my junior year at college, my business was selling a million dollars. Wow. My whole team. So I was making, you know, at that time, 98, I was making 80 grand part-time from my dorm and um you know it was pretty awesome i was making probably more than some of my college professors and this time. was what year was this 98 97 wow 98, yeah yeah so that was awesome i saved up enough money where by the time i graduated you know i put thirty thousand down on a house i mean it was pretty cool to do that at 21 22 and um then just i've been building that business up over the years, the cash flows really, really got really strong. So I was invested in the stock market because, you know, obviously what you take, your, you got to 
take your excess capital, right? Put it somewhere and put it right. to work. <clears throat> and I knew that was, you know, not really not my thing. But at the time, I didn't know what else to do because I didn't understand real estate. So long story short, stocks one day, I was heavily invested in oil and um, probably playing a little bit too risky. My stocks dropped by like 50% overnight. Was this about 2000? No, this is like 99, right? No, this was uh, this was four years ago. Oh, oh yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there wasn't even any market crash. Yeah. The market was doing good, but somehow I picked the ones that didn't do good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know. I see, I've had this tendency in stocks over the last two decades, buying high and selling low. It's not the formula for successful stock market <laughs> action. <laughs> so... You know, that was a great moment, though. Honestly, that was a very pivotal moment that I look back on and be like, wow, like what a blessing. Because that's what caused me to say, OK, enough is enough. I'm not riding this up and down roller coaster for the rest of my life. Right. I want to control of my, my investments and my assets. So I just started downloading podcasts. And that's really it. I mean, honestly, every morning at the gym, one hour podcast on real estate. So I'm going to learn this. I don't understand it. I don't know how to do it. <clears throat> and um, if you don't, if you're not educated on something and you, you like try to invest into it, I mean, that's a very, very likely chance that you're not going to do that great. So I got really, really um, educated, you know, listened to a hundred podcasts, devoured a hundred hours worth of uh, info, started reading books on the subject. Just really got my knowledge base up, not to expert status by any stretch, but enough to where I could comfortably make some buys. So I started purchasing property and, um, you know, some didn't work. Some were really, really good in Indianapolis. It's a really, really nice cash flow market. Oh yeah. That, that it really is a nice market because I was there for a dart tournament and sequestered an Airbnb. And I went into a neighborhood that reminded me of those neighborhoods I grew up in on the east side of Detroit. Mm -hmm. And then I knocked on the door sketchily, and then this beautiful home opened up. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's going mm -hmm. on? They're like, well, you know, there's a renaissance here in certain parts of the city because the property values were so low. Yep. Did you see that, that happening f from where you are as well? Yeah. I mean, you know, honestly, it's still the case. I mean, Indianapolis property values are still very low compared to the rest of the country. And there's certain, and it's really, there's several Midwestern cities where that's still the case with the price. So that means, you know, you can buy it at a price where it makes sense to rent it out and create cash flow. Yeah. You know, you can create 10, 12% net returns after all expenses. So you put in a hundred grand, you can realistically make, you know, 10 to $12,000 a year on that hundred thousand, which is a very, very good cap rate. That's unleveraged. That that's, that's crazy returns on yeah, your money. I mean, you know, most cap rates in the U S right now are like, I think the average is four. So, so, you know, it's almost triple the national average. You know, I have a question for you after this. I mean, it's a, and it's a very strategic question related to where you're buying your properties because there is some risk involved when you buy a property that you're not homesteading. Sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, the biggest thing for me was that I, somebody said it on a podcast. They said, look, I said, live where you want to live, but invest where it makes sense. Oh, that's a good one. And... So I was trying to buy property here in, you know, St. Joe, Michigan. Well, Whirlpool headquarters is here, what headquarters here, the worldwide headquarters. It's a very, very strong economy here. Um, you know, the prices of properties are are pretty pretty saucy, honestly. So I was looking around and I just couldn't find good deals. So I would put an offer in on a property, but then, you know, they'd make me wait two weeks because they'd give somebody else a chance to buy that foreclosure, <laughs> right? Right. So then I, I never, I couldn't buy anything. Right. Like, I got money, I got cash, I want to buy, I can't. At least at, you know, remotely good, you know, um, rate of return. So, yeah, so that's when, you know, I just said, okay, enough's enough. I'm going to go out of, you know, I'm going to go out of state. I'm going to go somewhere else. 
And yeah, so I started buying up in Indy and then I started uh, getting great returns. And of course, I'm posting it on Facebook, talking about it. I'm telling all my colleagues and friends and family. So they started going and buying up property from my provider. And then I realized that there was a, a really big market for this, for turnkey real estate, you know, where somebody else is doing all the legwork for you and you're just buying the basically buying a stream of income. Right. So I said, okay, to my provider at the time, I said, look, I mean, I've sent you all this business and yeah, he gave me some referral credits off my properties, but like, can I make some money here? You know, can I do, I think I can bring in a lot more business. He said, yeah, absolutely. Let's go. So I started, I started really ramping up my, you know, efforts to sell, started making some really good money. And, um, you know, continue to use those profits to buy more properties. Really, that was the whole point. Right. And then I um, got with my business partner, Shecky, who is my digital marketing coach in my nutrition company. And he had skill sets that like I didn't have. Like, this guy can, <laughs> this guy, he can craft words in an email. He's one of the best I've ever seen. So he's a very good copywriter. He's incredible. <laughs> he doesn't, he's very humble about it. And I have to keep telling him, man, dude, you are really good. And he's um, he's a lot more detail oriented, much more organized, much more systematic and structured. Mine is like, let's dude, let's fire away, man. You're like, what do they say? Um, ready, uh, fire, then aim. Right. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> if that gets me into trouble. <laughs> but he's more like, dude, dude, let's no, no, no. We're going to get ready. We're ready again. We're going to then we'll aim, we'll aim again, yep. and then we'll fire. Right? <laughs> so that um, we just really uh, counterbalance each other really well. That's good. So it's been, yeah, it's been a great partnership, and we've been able to scale the company because we've really focused on our branding, our company. So we created a really, really amazing website, HighReturnRealEstate.com. That's our. Um, we hired some really, really like some of the best in terms of digital marketing and website and development and design. They designed our whole website. They created, um, we created a podcast too. We hired um, these guys also to do our SEO. So they, they've got us ranked in number one on a lot of keywords in Google. Right. Which isn't that easy to do, which I have no idea remotely how to do that. I mean, So what's your audience now? Did it grow once you got the podcast or was it just on a kind of an incline and then you added the podcast and how did that affect your uh, whole scheme? You know, the the podcast to me is we don't have a, a huge amount of downloads. Um, I haven't checked our numbers lately, which I guess I really should be tracking that, right? But yes. To me, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So coach me here, you know, after the call or something. So we, uh, we, I really look at it though, as a way to, when people come into our ecosystem, like visit our website, come in through our SEO, come in through some realtor or a real estate investing um, forums. We get a lot of business through those that they build. It builds trust with us. That's all I think really, I think the purpose is for us. Yeah. That's important because I've seen a lot of, you know, let me put it to you this way. There are a lot of people who are online who are showing you how to do things and haven't done them themselves. Very true. And the, well, they've done them with marginal success. Rates. Yeah. They're making you, more money trying to tell, sell you. How yeah. To do it. I mean, like marginal yeah. success. So I commend you guys for being, you know, so on board. I mean, like above board about it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's great. So. <laughs> We um, we've uh, we've sold um, some around this just this year. We have fixed and flipped. I think it's about eighty to ninety properties. And you don't so, have a TV show? No, we do not. <laughs> That's the next move, my man. All right, tell me more. So, yeah, we've um, we've gotten it all through just uh, referrals, taking good care of clients, making sure that they're. We always want to do the right thing and be fair with our clients. You know, if they're, you know, we provide a one year warranty. So, you know, water heater breaks, furnace breaks, that's going to, that stuff's all going to happen. And even out of our control, even if we 
do our best to mitigate all those issues. So we replace them for, you know, for our clients. So do you have someone ready to buy before you flip or do you have like, how, how does that process work for you? Because you seem to put together a slightly different plan than most people, which is, okay, I'm going to buy this property. I'm going to sit on this property. I'm going to make this 10, 12 grand mm-hmm. on my um, property. I'm going to do that again to where I get to where I make 75 grand a year of, you know, revenue being generated while I sleep. Sure. So Pass, your passive income. Absolutely. Yeah. So your plan, you're also buying and flipping, um, for individuals or you're doing bulk sales. How does the whole scheme work? Yeah. So we, uh, we acquire the property we have, so we have an acquisitions guy, Kevin, that he's been in the market for 20 years. He knows Indy backwards, forwards, everything. So he goes out and he finds them. Lots of different methods, you know, but he's, basically they're all distressed properties to some degree. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's the only way you're really getting deals. Yep. That's true. You know, if you're buying something that's done and pretty and turnkey and all of that, I mean, you're, you're probably buying at market price. Whereas, we're making our money because we're able to buy it at the discount and then we fix it up and create that value spread. So we force the equity. Right. Right. So all, typically, I mean, they could be as much as like, you know, needs a thirty, forty thousand dollar $40,000 rehab on a, you know, 50, 60, $70,000 property. I mean, it could be quite extensive where it's just dilapidated. And they're old. Some of these homes are old too. Well, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are old. And, um, you know, we're could be anywhere from, you know, we've had them as 10, 20 years old, 50 to 100. So, but a lot of, you know, a lot of the 100 year old homes, the bones of those are better than the ones that were built within the last, you know, two or three decades. Yeah, they were, to be honest. They were built with mud and stone and <laughs> like a castle. <laughs> <laughs> like something about them is just solid. It's going to be here for the next, you know, 200 years. So, we buy that, the asset, some of them, you know, 5,000 we need to put into them. Um, occasionally we get lucky and we only need to put a thousand or two into it. But for the most part, it's, you know, it's a, it's a $5,000 rehab or, you know, we try to stay, we're trying to stay away from now the, the complete gut jobs, 20, 30, because when you get into those and really open them up, Ooh. oh man, like you could get into some real problems that you had no idea when you bought it, that you we're going to be facing that kind of challenge. And then like, you know, broke, you, you had no idea when you bought the property that the sewage line between the house and the street is broken. Right. <laughs> well, that is causes you to have to dig. I've been there. I've been, and I've fixed been, it. And been it's on. not cheap. I mean, that adds another four or five grand, right? Yeah. Well, our margins are pretty thin that we're operating on when we sell these. So that basically wipes away a good chunk of profit. So once we get it rehabbed, we get a third party inspector to come in and check everything. And um, a lot of people, our investors, you know, some really, really love that process because they, you know, like they didn't have to order the inspection. Others don't trust the fact that we ordered the third party inspection, right? Like the guy's in our back pocket or something. Right. And I get that, but it's an independent company from us. Um, they, they're very reputable in the area. They do, you know, thousands of, uh, you know, inspections. So look, it's the reason we do it is to be proactive. If you have a, when we, so if let's say we've got a tenant in place and then the buyer prospective buyer, they order inspection. That is such a nightmare of epic proportions. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to get the inspector to scheduled in with a C-class tenant. Number one is a struggle in itself. <laughs> They don't because they don't answer their door when they're supposed to answer their door or, you know, just all the chaos of their life, whatever. And we all have chaos, right? Yeah. So, every, so it's it's not just this class, but this the C-class property tenant is they're tougher to deal with. So then you got to do their inspection repairs. Well, then you got to go back in and schedule maybe two or three different contractors to go in and do different miscellaneous repairs that need to be done. And this house and, and typically these houses are inhabited that you purchase or are they empty? We try to buy them vacant, to be honest, just because it's so much easier 
to do the rehab and then do the, you know, do the repairs after we do the inspection. Here's my question. What about the security? Because my dad has several homes. I bought one or two and the rehab process, particularly in an urban area can be challenging, especially if, for instance, uh, right after 2008, I had a property where as soon as my buddy left out, he's like, I'm going on vacation. I'll be back in two weeks. I was like, okay. Copper was gone. Yeah. Furnace was <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a legit ticket. We've had that happen. Absolutely. So how do you combat that? Yeah. So we're putting in all PEX plumbing, which is there's no value in it. You know, it's, it's, there's, there's really nothing to steal there. It's that plastic. PVC. It's like a plastic. Um, yeah. Like a tan tube. plastic. Yeah, it's blue. They're always it's a yeah. blue tube. Yeah, and um, they, they don't freeze either. So in the winter time in Indiana, it's it's you know your never pipes are never going to bust, right. which is great. Um, we don't put the furnaces in until we have a tenant moving in. So it's usually two or three days before, right? Um, same with the water heaters. You know? So there's really nothing to steal, to be honest. I mean, they could grab our kitchen cabinets or something like that. We have um, found this security system where you can put in for pretty pretty nominal price. You can put a security system in that alert the police if somebody breaks oh, in. Yeah. And those are those are you know if we've got a home that where we really don't want anybody to come in, you know we'll put that in and it it's it's great. It it works amazing and deters anybody. So, I mean a big you know big alarm go is going off if somebody breaks in that shouldn't be in there. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, definitely. You know, these are all the problems and challenges you know that that we have to solve. Like what you're bringing up. I mean, it's it's a ch- it is a challenging business. So then, once we get it all everything done, inspected, we repair it again, we'll put a tenant in place, and then and only then do we offer that product to the investor. So that way, when they buy it, they're cash flowing from day one, and they are really more like comfortable with the process that hey. This is already a cash flow producing asset. I'm not going to wait three or four or five, six months for this to get done to then get a tenant in place. I'm going to, I know what I'm buying and I know exactly what I'm getting. So, you're, so that's. You're still going. giving it to them under market value or you know, thereabouts. I would, I would say there, there's some deals where they're under market value, but I'd say at, at m- most of the time they're going to be buying an asset like this at market price. You know, um, it's really, really difficult to for us to make any money selling the property too much under market value because you know we're that's where our profit margin is is in the equity spread. I right. Mean, it's a forty. These are forty, fifty thousand dollar homes. Sixty thousand, seventy on a duplex, maybe. So it's just not. It's not that much margin for us to be giving massive discounts and keep our company going. So let me let me ask you from this point of view. I've seen Indianapolis and there's this kind of gentrification happening where older neighborhoods, you're starting to get what happened in the seventies in most major cities in the Midwest. We had this kind of white flight. I saw it in Detroit and I've seen it in uh, Cleveland. I've seen it in most of the major cities around the Midwest. Mm-hmm. And my daughter explained it to me, the one I was telling you about, she, I was like, why? I was like, you guys, People would never go back down to the city. She was like, "Daddy, we 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 can't afford the two three hundred thousand dollar house, right? But we can all of us pitch in, and Jack Jack has two grand, and we're all going to crash there, and we're going to fix his house up, and then the one across the street's going to come up for sale, and then." Jack's going to stay there and the rest of us are going to go to that house. And then next thing you know, you have a neighborhood that's functional. And then our bars that we like come in and our restaurants come in. I was like, oh, that makes sense. So so why wouldn't you just keep the properties and just amass this cash flow cow that's starting to just over time give you that necessary income? Sure. Uh, I do. I, Ah. I do. I do have plenty of my own. Um, that I'm holding and creating passive income on. And that's really, honestly, that's the entire goal for me is just to create more passive income. But you just have two revenue streams. You have two models for your business versus just a single, 
income stream. Exactly. And, you know, um, flipping properties is it's just all about time, value of money. I mean, I certainly could do all this whole process, hold the property for rents and, you know, I'll make probably the same in over the course of 12 months that I would in flipping it in a month. So it's just a time value of money. I'm just increasing the velocity of which we're able to, you know, create income. Now, the problem that I come up against is, and this is going to only get worse. It's not going to get better (laughs) is the taxes on short-term flips is massively terrible. So is it because of the non-homestead? Well, it's just you're taxed at ordinary income. So whatever your tax bracket is at at that time, if you're a high income earner, Mm. you're paying almost 50% taxes. Even if you're going through a company, this yeah. other legal entity versus your personal, Absolutely. it's the same it doesn't rate. Matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That sucks. That was the it whole sucks. point of being in business. Oh. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really bad because you're putting so much. You're putting risk out there. You're putting so much time and effort, and you know the government gets to take half. Which okay, well, oh. it is. That's how it's set up. Yeah, but you know, so the the honestly, like the investor, the passive income investor. <laughs> They're buying an asset that we created and did a lot of forced equity on and and they're buying even they're buying say they're buying it at market value right they're still in a in a one year's hold they're gonna be the the rents that are gonna come in are gonna cause them to be at a cost price that's well below market value yeah. so they just have to wait one year and now all the cash flow that they got from rents is gonna reduce their cost basis on that asset and now they ha- also have a an asset that is automatically generating income every month. Plus, they're being taxed at the lowest uh, tax rate because it's passive income. So it's like for the passive investor, it's a wonderful thing. So we provide a lot of value. And um, that's why pretty much, too, like what we do, we can't even keep any property in stock. Once something crosses the finish line where it's ready for sale, people are ready honestly. Yeah, we we sell them within 24 hours. Wow. So do you have yeah. a list of people that you your go-to people or is this like public knowledge like hey guys, this is what we have to the public or you have your client list that are just waiting that cuz they trust yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, we we it's not always the case where we have a wait list of 3 or 4 or 5 even 10 people waiting for a property to be for us to get done to serve up to them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so sometimes we Go to the uh, the Sheckmeister, we call him, and say, "Hey, man, dude, dude, you know we don't have a, an investor lined up right now. Craft your, you know, email, and he'll craft an email, and then within 24 hours of him sending out an email to our list, it's sold. So we definitely don't sit on properties for very long, and um, which tells us that we need to create more supply because our demand is so strong, right? Yeah." So it's it's not easy though to create and just say okay yeah we're going to create more supply like that's a you know that's a process that takes time to more, we need more capital we need more construction teams we need more um, we need more team we need more everybody yeah. <laughs> to be able to increase supply you have to scale to up be able to match up with demand right yeah. so that's what we're trying to do it's just it's, it's easier much easier said than it is done yeah. I- when is the best time to buy? Because to me, it would have been, it's, you should, like, right now we're in a boom time. We're in an yeah. economic, massive boom time. Sure. So now should be the time where you, this is my theory. You should be sitting on your hands, stacking your dough. And then, because it's going to turn. It Absolutely. Al- it always turns south. I 100% concur with you. And then when it turns south, You've got your stack that you can play with and you can make moves. Or is now a good time to buy? So when is a good time to buy? I think that's more market-specific question, like in terms of geography-specific question, than it is overall question. So let's put – so give you an example, right? So we got the coastal cities where California, for example – you could buy an asset right now. You could uh, try to rent it out, and you're going to probably get, if you're lucky, a three percent cap rate net return. 
So you put a hundred thousand in, you're lucky you get three thousand dollars cash flow. Right. <clears throat> okay. So if anything turns in the market and that property were to drop in value and now you're underwater, it's gonna take you a very, very long time, like a really long time, <laughs> decade, two decades worth of rents to make up for that loss in, in equity value that you just had. Right. So if we look at cities in the Midwest where they haven't gone up in nearly to that level in value or in price, like for, for so give Indianapolis a, a look. So you got a property that's, you know, say it's uh, 45,000 rents for 650 bucks a month, 700 bucks, right? So <clears throat> you buy it for 45,000 and then the market corrects. Okay. Well, how much is that property really going to drop in value? I mean, is it going to drop in half? Well, that's never really happened in the market. I mean, maybe maybe Las Vegas had happened, right? It yeah. dropped in half in back in 2008. But that's pretty, pretty rare to, for, for even for that to happen. <clears throat> so let's say it drops 20% in value. So now you dropped uh, $8,000, 8000 $10,000 in value. Your cash flow you can, that you're getting in, in rents can make up for that loss in one year. Yeah, so that's true. It's all about what kind of cash flow are you getting on the versus like the purchase price where where is that risk i i don't know i don't like like you're saying i think it's going to crash i wouldn't say crash it's going to correct how much who knows right everything is going so good and yeah, it's this, gone so this long. is this is yeah because i remember the last one and it sucked it was bad <laughs> it was it was really bad I, I bought a house. We bought our second house. We were, had a baby on the way. We bought it for 300 and that was in Ooh. 2000, December of 2007. Ooh. Yeah. And, and you know so, what? I mean, it dropped 50000 within three or four months. Oh, uh, you know what's funny is, you know, the median house, depending on where you are, can be 200, 300,000. Like where I live in Indi uh, Indiana, there are houses who that are probably, if you're lucky, you can get one for 130. But if you go a quarter of a mile, it is seven million dollars. Sure. And you know we have that diaspora in America, but how can someone begin to invest when they don't have the cash? Because taking out mortgages, um, leveraging yourself to the hilt can turn out pretty bad if, like you said, the market drops even a couple of points and you've leveraged yourself, your cash flow. How can people start if they're interested but don't have the cash flow? That's a really wonderful question that I don't have too much of an answer <laughs> to. All of our investors are cash investors. And you know what? You just iterated what my dad used to tell me my dad used to, i was like dad i want to be like you want to have houses he was like here he was like if you want to have money he was like as soon as you start working i think i was like 13 he says calculate this number he was like 0.8 he's like and live off that i'm like why 0.8 he's like because the other 20 percent goes directly in the bank for the entire term of your life or in an investment i was yeah. like not in, a, in my 50s, I understand what he was saying. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very sound advice, right? <laughs> right. Because then you're able to take advantage of opportunities when you come up. Cash is king. That is true. I just did a, I do this thing called Saturday Morning with Emmett. And I was telling people, stop living like America programs you to live. Stop looking at other people and comparing yourself and save your money. I'm like, you know, most Americans don't have a thousand dollars in the bank that they can just go grab for whatever reason. Yeah. I'm, I said, you need at least ten thousand dollars in the bank. And like you can have ten thousand dollars no matter what your income in two years so that when an opportunity comes for you to make a move that requires capital, you have it. At hand, I'm like, you can do a lot with $10,000. It can get you in the door to make more money to c keep compounding that savings. 
And I had some friends that looked at me like, you are out of your mind. I'm like, no, it works. I'm telling you, it works mm-hmm. really well because you're in a position. So are there groups that buy these houses together? We, we sell more to individual investors. So we haven't had any uh, buying groups come mm-hmm. in yet. I'm sure that as we gain, you know, more, um, you know, publicity and, and create a, a stronger brand image, that will certainly happen. We'll, buyers will collect their money. But, you know, because the asset price is only 40, 50,000, you know, like it does to me, it doesn't make that much sense for somebody to go in with a group and buy a property because then they don't have total control over yeah. the asset of when they want to buy and sell again if they if they do choose like, to do this. It's like a co-op house. Yeah, yeah. You know, to, I just want to make a just a kind of a, a thought point about, you know, what people do if they don't have cash. Look, I mean, create a side hustle and increase your income. I mean, either that or you, so you can, you can save the 20%, which I totally 100% well aligned with that. That's been critical for uh, for me to be able to get in the game of real estate is to be able to, you know, I saved up over the years, always living below our means. And, you know, we buy used cars, right? I mean, I'm buying, I was always buying cars with 30, 40,000 miles on them. Yeah. Nice, nice cars, but, you know, you save so much money, you know, when you do that. And so we, you know, we were very, very frugal with our money and then just working on, my own particular mindset and investing into myself and my skills so that I can be more valuable to the marketplace so that I can make more money because it's a, it's a slow process to just stay at the same income and save that 20%. That's the foundation. You got to have that, but that's slow. If you want to accelerate the velocity of which you're able to get into this game and play, you know, the passive income game, which is to me the only game money game there really is, then I've got to figure out, okay, how can I become more valuable to other human beings? How can I become more valuable to the marketplace? And the only way you do that is you've got to invest into yourself. You got to invest into yourself, reading books, going to seminars, listening to podcasts, like what you do. This is awesome. And increase that mindset and increase those skills so that boom, you can create a side hustle and actually make money with it. So do you have any protégés who are coming to you saying, look, can I just tail you? Can I just hang around you guys and see what you do? Like to learn our model? To Yeah, just to, just as we say, soak up the game. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, not in real estate, I don't. I mean, we don't, we haven't had that. Um I have some that'll be like, yeah, can you, you know, I consider you like a mentor, you know, if I have questions, can I, can I ask? I'm like, of course, of course, you know, I I love mentoring and helping other people that are trying to become successful. But um, in, in the nutrition business and my multi-level marketing business, I get that a lot more where, you know, I'm mentoring and, and really training and, and helping hungry people because, you know, in that, in that business, the two totally different styles of, of people that I'm working with. Right. Like in the MLM world, it's a lot more 20 twenties and early thirties that are yeah. coming in that are hungry and they want to create success in their life. And so I can really make a big impact on them with my philosophy and words and things that I teach them. Whereas in the real estate world, I'm more dealing with people that have created some success in their life and they've got cash. So they've done something right over the years. Right. And they're looking for a way just to deploy that with somebody that they trust. So it's like just two different, um, you know, people that I'm really working with. So it's been, it's great. I love them both. Good. So what's your next moves, my man? You guys have the podcast. Are you guys going to start having seminars where you're, you know, talking about this process and talking with other investors and talking about the changes in the market and helping people along this process? I think that's something down the road we love to do. Both Sheck and I love to speak and train. Um, one of my favorite things to do is, you know, is to be on a stage. I think you even mentioned that, that you love, that's your, your passion, right? Yeah, it's run my mouth. <laughs> run your mouth. <laughs> I'm sure you're very good at it. 
And so that's, you know, probably, you know, one of the things you feel most alive, right? When you're on a stage in front of people, that's like fills up your bucket. And so that's ultimately like, you know, it's where we want to be. And that's where we're really feel like we're taking advantage of our, you know, our gifts that we were given. So love to do that. I think right now, our, you know, we have got to figure out just how to stay more consistent with the things that we're doing that are working, right? Like create more podcasts. We haven't even created any YouTube video content yet. What? Yeah. I mean, like, you guys yeah. have a wealth of stuff to create content from. I mean, you could just you could just go in once a day mm-hmm. with your iPad or your phone to the property and show the process. I mean, that in itself is content. Good yeah. content at that. Absolutely. So I, I'm a, I'm aligned. <laughs> so when you need that uh that video marketing manager, <laughs> yeah, I probably do. <laughs> For sure. Like we we've we know that that's a huge way to additional medium of video content. But yet, you know, it's not getting done. We actually do have a scheduled video shoot in two weeks where we're going to knock out like 20, 30 videos all at one time in a green room. So on a, on a green screen. So we are taking strides towards that. But um, we need to do that first yeah. you know, before we start taking that next level to go into seminars, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Build a house with a brick at a time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that the ultimate goal is to where we can, we really want to scale our business to where we can be doing 30, 40 deals in a month. You know, and right now, you know, we're at, I think, maybe, what are we at? Eight eight deals a month. That's still good. That's it's Yeah, it's great. And we're not, there's definitely nothing wrong with that, but you know, in this business, the way our margins are set, it's all about volume. You know, we've got to have more volume to really, you know, really reach the kind of the goals that we really have. So that's really it. It's like, we've got to figure out and dial in our systems more so that we can scale up more responsibly. So you said something really good. I always am aligned with what you said, which is you have to invest in yourself because you said this earlier, very early in our interview, you're like, I was in college and it was like, meh, meh. Because I remember when I came out of school, I went to school for electronics and couldn't put my radio in my car. And it wasn't until I started to learn the things that I needed to learn that were applicable after school that I began to prosper. And I said, wow, this world is really open because there's a lot of things that they're not teaching. You just have to go and figure it out. Same thing with real estate. So where can people find your podcast? Where can they find more information in case they are curious and want to find out how to move forward? Um, hi, our website, everything is right there in that, you know, like what I call an ecosystem, you know, it's uh, high return real estate.com. And we have properties, sample properties listed there. We have uh, all about our model, what we do, what we provide. They can even book a call with our head of investor relations, Nicole. She's um, amazing. People love her. And she's also an investor. She started off as one of my first clients too. So, mm-hmm. you know, if, I th- I'm huge on building teams in business. I think, you know, I've got two very, very, you know, successful businesses. I mean, the, the nutrition company is a $10 million, $12 million yearly enterprise. Yeah. And in the real estate's headed that way, probably maybe this year, probably next year for sure. It's all about, to me, is creating teams I'm putting people around you that have skills that complement or also maybe skills that you don't have. So we would just, I feel like that's what I'm best at is just building teams of people that are really good and put them in their lane and just let them let it rip, like let them do their thing. And we all can create more together versus me trying to be a solo guy, trying to go at it myself I, I just I wouldn't be able to do a whole lot if it was just me because I don't know what I'm really all that good at. 
besides putting teams together. <laughs> See, and that's a good skill to have. And that's one thing that most people don't get is that you re- need a really good team because you can only do so much on your own. And at some point you have to have other eyes on the goal t- to accomplish difficult task. Yeah. Well, I want to yeah. thank you so much for being on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. We didn't talk a whole lot about like lifestyle, did we? Like my lifestyle in terms of... You just did. I did? Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, this you, you just talked about what is your lifestyle. So the lifestyle is really whatever you create. And yeah. this is what most people don't realize. They are the captains of the ship. But sometimes they're so busy looking at the ship next to them that they crash onto the shore. Yeah. So no, you're right. And that's why I have people like yourself and so many others on. So they, someone may identify like this is not, you know, I mean, real estate investing, it's not a thing, but someone out there might be, going, oh, wow, let me check. I never really thought I could be able to do that. You know, I do have some capital. Maybe I'm going to start really small. I'm just going to buy this house and it doesn't have to be linear. I'm going to buy this house. I'm going to fix it up myself and live in it while I have no kids or while I, you know, and then once I get it up, I'm going to sell this. I'm going to take that and flip. You know, there's more than one way to flip a property or to flip anything. Really. You just have to be able to open your mind. And that's what the billionaire lifestyle is about. It's not about money. It's about the opportunity. It's about living. And it's about the fact that 30 days after one cell met another, Two to the power of 30 mm-hmm. is over a billion. So yeah. those little That's cluster awesome. of sales were already a billionaire. So you're a billionaire. Yeah. So now it's time to go live life and experience it. That's right. That's awesome. Yeah. I think to, to kind of close out my, my thoughts is the most important part about actually, you know, creating an incredible lifestyle is passive income. Like you, you got to figure out a way to create, ongoing streams of income that are coming in regardless of whether you're actually putting the work in right now or not. So it's either passive income style business, passive income style investment, something to where, you know, you're, you keep continually getting paid each and every month, regardless of the current effort. That's to me is how you create an incredible lifestyle. Cause then now you're, you're free to do what you want every day. Yep. Well, Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, guess how it ends? It ends with me inspiring you. Remember, when you get out the shower, because everybody takes a shower every day, drop the towel and just be with yourself. Turn some music on, maybe some Stevie Wonder, dance around the bathroom and then wipe the fog off the mirror and just bask in your glory because that's how you came to this planet. So don't be ashamed of it. As a matter of fact, fall in love with yourself. Look into your eyes and realize that as above, so below. They look like little nebulae that are in the galaxy as above, so below. So you're connected to everything. Stop thinking you're alone. Stop thinking you're unloved. It all starts with you. Appreciate the miracle that you are. And then appreciate the miracles that are around you. And that's other people. Treat them with honor, love, and respect. And remember, continue the process of learning. Till next time, love you all. Peace.